welcome again. And um, uh, just a little bit background on the panel discussion that we'd like to do. Uh, industry is interested in doing whatever they can to provide sustainability of their operations through any economic dips and is interested in understanding more about how our region is viewed by economic developers, education providers, and the community in general when times get tough. Paying higher taxes, lower margins for products, and ever-increasing regulatory red tape can force plants to make tough decisions about personnel, training, and community support activities. With a better understanding about economic development and training efforts, we may be able to provide greater stability through what looks like a dip in the roller coaster ride. So um, first of all, I'd like to ask each of you to please just uh, provide an overview of your area of work and how industry has affected you over the last few years, uh, the good times here that we've been having. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to start that. I would like to uh, begin by thanking you for having me, uh, but more importantly, thanking you, uh, industry leaders, for everything that you have done for this region. It is amazing somebody coming into this region from the outside and not really knowing a lot about it to see the incredible amount of industrial investment and industrial activity and expertise that exists in this marketplace. And the lifestyle that you have provided to our citizens uh, and just, just a century parish alone. Uh, I just looked up last week, the average weekly manufacturing wage in Ascension Parish is $1,931 which has driven us to have the highest per median household income of any parish in the state of Louisiana. And for that, we are most appreciative for everything you do. Uh, but as far as our base business, uh, we're pretty much typical of a county-wide, parish-wide economic development agency that you'll see anywhere in the country. Uh, we are a not-for-profit corporation that was uh, actually founded by the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Ascension Chamber of Commerce, the City of Gonzales, and Ascension Parish. We receive money from uh, Ascension Parish. I saw, where's John Cagnolotti back there, a good parish councilman and former board member back there in the corner. Thank you, John. And from the City of, of Gonzales to fund our operations. And I said, pretty typical of what you know, what you'll see in, in area, any area working with new companies who want to come in and with our existing companies uh, to sh make sure they're happy and keep spending money. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad to be back in Louisiana. I actually grew up here in the state, and so I'm back after many, many years. And I'm so excited to be here, particularly working with our, our institutions across the state. And as was, was indicated by Lauren, we have very different things happening in different regions of the state. It's really a lot different what I do in one area versus some of these areas here that really have a robust economy here. What I want to do first is tell you on behalf of the Louisiana Community and Technical College System, it's very important that you understand one thing about our system. Our system is not a business and industry friendly system. It is a business and industry centric system. All of the decisions that we make or how to meet your workforce needs. Now we have students and we treat our students well as internal clients, but know that we can do nothing for these students without the jobs and the opportunities that all of you provide. So as we talk about a roller coaster ride today, we ride with you. I mean, we ride the ups, we ride the downs. I've been here a little over a year now and I came into the state and we had huge skills gaps that we were all wide-eyed and thinking, I think I speak on behalf not only of our system, but of my friends and colleagues at ABC and with other public and private training providers. We, we ride this thing together. We all have our niches in what we do. It was a little frightening with some of the projections of what we need, particularly in the skilled crafts. I still don't see a lot of that abating. We still see a huge demand for skilled crafts. And a lot of what we're seeing is that exit of people, of older workers, of older, highly skilled workers from the workforce and the need to replace those. And then the other critical thing that I've seen in my year here, which is even more important, is not only the focus that we have as a system in preparing entry-level workers, but what we can do with other training providers and partners in elevating and promoting growth within those existing workers that you have. As the conditions rise and fall, 
the one thing that has not changed is increasing demands for new technology and increasing demands for our workers to be more highly skilled and more knowledgeable than ever. So yes, it's a wild roller coaster ride, Connie, but we're happy to be doing it with you. Again, our fate is tied to yours. Excellent, thank you. Um, next, let's talk about when a company is considering a new location or an expansion in the region, what would you say are the key things that they are looking for, that these companies are looking for? Well, as, as fate would have it, uh, we have a publication, industry publication, called Area Development Magazine uh, that is the audience's facility planning executives and site location consultants and people like myself, and they do a survey every year about the key factors of locating act, uh, economic activities, and that just landed on my desk about two weeks ago. So, and this is nationwide, I understand, it may not be directly pertinent to, to the local area, but I'll give you some flavor. The number one thing, highway access. And that has to do with time to market. Uh, there was a quote in, uh, in the particular, this particular publication on this subject that said the new, the new measure is five to 55. In other words, they're saying five minutes to 55 miles an hour is the new location factor. Uh, that doesn't portend very well, I think, for our current situation here with our uh, highway congestion. So it tells you the importance of, of continuing to address our infrastructure. Uh, the second factor was occupancy costs and construction costs. Uh, again, uh, you know, that's a, a factor that, uh, you know, is somewhat out of, out of our local control, certainly, and, and statewide control, but uh, we know that that is a key factor everywhere. Availability of land and infrastructure. Again, another key factor, especially for Ascension, uh, as uh, we look around and we have opportunities to, uh, to bring in new companies, we are in a pretty tough situation. Uh, right now as far as, as site. Uh, and we're trying to remedy that. Uh, some of you may have read and seen what we're trying to do on the West Bank in the Modest McCall area, which is develop a mega park of 15, 16,000 acres. Uh, and uh, we're trying to, to address that issue. Uh, the next factor, key factor is available buildings. And again, that is, a, that is something that we do not have in this marketplace to speak of. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing, because usually if you have an available building, it means somebody went out of business. So you know, we haven't had a lot of companies go out of business, so we don't have a lot of vacant space. But the other thing that I don't see in this market is any industrial spec going on. Now, when I say industrial, I'm talking about you know, pretty large scale stuff, not the, you know, you see a lot of industrial service spec, you know, the five, 6,000 square foot service space, there's quite a bit of that out there. But anything bigger than that, it just, there's just not a spec market in, in this area, unlike there is in most parts of the country. And then finally, the last, it's not last, but the number five thing was certainly not, you know, these, the difference between one and five is subtle, but the availability of skilled labor. Uh, you know, Dennis has already uh, addressed that. I'm delighted to see what's going on as far as these new partnerships with the public schools uh, and the community and technical colleges, the uh, jumpstart programs and all the monikers that are out there. I think we're headed in the right direction on that. I'd love to weigh in a little on that. That's really a question directed largely at Mike, but Having had the experience of uh, being a partner with Mike, not only here, but in the previous state too, in the economic development world, we have, we, we've run some similar roads in our past. But, you know, for years and years, as I was working in the economic development and the workforce development arena, I would look up at these surveys that come out that, that Mike just cited. And, you know, in my early part of my career, that workforce thing was down there, oh, 10 or so on that list. It just kind of hung, and we kept saying to everybody, we're important too, we're important too. The reality is companies are going to go where they can make a profit. And as Lauren said, the math has to be there. And as Mike has said, the geography has to be right for that profit-making thing. But high up in that equation now is do you have the skilled workforce that can work with advanced technologies. 
Do you have the kind of people that it can prepare? If you want, and I used to tell people all this, and I don't think Michael disagree with me. If you want to be attractive as a community to further investment, you put those skilled workers out there, and they're going to be looking at you. Now, barring the fact they have to have those transportation parameters and all those things that make pro profitability fact important, but the key thing for so many companies now, and I've worked with dozens and dozens of site selectors through my career, is do you have a workforce that can accommodate rapidly advancing technology? And so again, I think the partners that we have here, all of us that are in the workforce training business, we work well together. We're geared up well, I think, to do this kind of work. It's tremendous partnerships, but we're doing it in a very constrained economy, and we're doing it with fewer and fewer resources, and we're having to become more and more innovative progressively. But I, I, again, I can't overemphasize, you know it yourselves. All of you are constantly looking for that talent. So it is a huge factor in getting people to look at your community. Excellent. Thank you. That, that gives some good ideas. Um, question number three, can you provide an example of a very successful project and why it was successful from your perspective in recent times? Well, I hate to single out a project because they're all important. Every job is important <laughs> to us, but uh, I see Glenn Fontenot sitting back there. And certainly this Methanex project was, was most, most interesting uh, from the viewpoint of physically dismantling a facility, facilities <laughs> in South America and moving them to Louisiana, certainly something I'd never experienced in my career. And give you a little bit of more background beyond the physical aspects of that. Uh, one key turning point in that project, without, I hope I'm not getting proprietary here, is we had to get a tax ruling from uh, both the state and from Ascension Parish as to how that, that equipment was going to be treated as far as sales taxes. <laughs> and there was a, a little discussion, substantial discussion about that actually ended up being a positive. I think if it hadn't been a positive, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it because that could have been a big number. Uh, and then, you know, the other things that, that they had to deal with, about, uh, you know, bringing that uh, massive amount of equipment up the river and across the levee and, you know, the, both the physical and the regulatory challenges of, of doing that. Thankfully, the river wasn't high like it is now because if they were trying to do that right now, I think they'd really be in trouble <laughs> uh, because of, of the restrictions on moving things across the river. But I just point that out, uh, you know, as, as something certainly very intriguing on our part. Worked out well. Thank you, Glenn, and a wonderful corporate neighbor. Now, thank you. Um, and Dennis, from your perspective also, um, I know that there are a number of uh, companies have contracted with you guys directly, such as Apraxair, and had made some big projects, if you will, that were tied to uh, doing a new project and so forth. Uh, do you have an example? Oh, yeah. Well, you mentioned Praxair and just trying to work at populations that we can move into the workforce with high skills and meet your needs. And certainly the ability to partner with companies is, you know, if I look at what works well, there's one thing that always comes to the top, and that's partnership. You know, we, we looking from the college side of things, we, we, we have to listen to you. We have to be responsive to what you need to see happen in the workplace. And since I've been here, I've had a lot of experiences with companies contacting me directly, needing large numbers of skilled people. And my first question is always this, are you willing to partner? Are you willing to put your subject matter experts at a table with us? and take the time that it takes to develop the programs, whether it be a short-term or a long-term program. It, the, the answer to successful things is partnership. And there's just no way that we can do it alone. We wish we could do it for you without you having to spend the time and the money and the energy to partner with us, but it's just not possible. So again, Praxair was a good example. What we're doing with the Nat North Baton Rouge Alliance in partnership with Gabri and with many, many of you I think holds tremendous progress for this, for this region. And I'm going to give an example, too, from another region of something that we did. And it really came down to illustrate exactly what I mean by partnership. In central Louisiana, we have a lot of manufacturers up there who are really trying to remain competitive globally. And one of the things that they kept telling us was, and I don't think you'll argue with this, any of you in this room, is we don't know where our maintenance people for our factories are going to come in the future. 
We're losing so many senior people, we don't know how we're going to do it. And so we sat down at the table with about six manufacturers and had detailed conversations about these issues. And one of the things we figured out is that we could reduce workload on existing maintenance people by, by upskilling the operators that operate the equipment and the plants. So we launched a program. It was an apprenticeship effort. And what we did was those companies made a commitment. They were going to allow those workers to come to our training facilities to train. They would train three days a week, and then they would go apply what they knew in their plants two days a week under an apprenticeship model. Through that first 120 days, this was the new workers that were coming online, we had significant success with this. And the managers who made a commitment to do this, there were three companies that stepped forward to take that first pilot project. And what they told me was, we can tell the difference walking in the plant between who's in the training and who's not because they're contributing more, they're more knowledgeable. They feel like they have the self-esteem to give us those better ideas, those solutions that come from the people doing it every day. So that project was so successful now that we have a number of those companies who are now hiring people, paying them to go through, putting them on their wages. I'm not saying that's for everybody, but what that does indicate is this. What we have to do as a college is we have to have a value proposition. We have to be able to actually get people to perform better on the job, and it has to provide a return on investment for you. We understand that piece. All of those successes weren't about me or our team at the colleges. It was about the partnership with those businesses and all of us working together to create a situation in which we could really move the marker. So we did. We are upscaling operators. The amazing thing is when we put them through training, some of those operators show a lot of skill in some of these technical areas. And so we're continuing to train those to develop in-house maintenance personnel. So solutions are found together. And I think any time that I look at what's been successful, it's been because of partnership. Very, very good points. Very good. And, and Mike, in, if you think of the last few years, the, the, the key thing that you were telling us about is number one being the uh, 5 to 55. Uh, did that come up in any of your successful um, projects uh, here of recent years? Where, where well, it's all, well I mean, and transportation, transportation costs are always in the equation, and they're usually up at the top. <laughs> and that was not always, in, because of our industry mix, it's not always highway. Uh, obviously, we got other other modes that we have an advantage, uh, rail and, and uh, guards, et cetera. But yes, it always comes up, in, uh, you know, regardless of what kind of project we're dealing with, highway access and being able to get to the interstate and beyond. And it's, and it's usually the focus is on moving of goods. It's well, the main usually focus the, or usually the focus is on the movement of goods, but we're hearing a lot about people, <laughs> you know, getting people to work on time mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and that type of thing is also. And I think, you know, in some cases, a, con a concern about safety uh, from the viewpoint of, of traffic being so tied up in the vicinity of the plants that you know, in the case of an accident, unfortunate accident or, or an occurrence, you know, the ability to get safety equipment, safety uh, first uh, responders into the area is, is a serious concern. Absolutely, absolutely. And so hope, hopefully uh, folks in the audience know about the effort that Gabria is working on together with the Baton Rouge Area Chamber and the Center for Planning Excellence uh, called Crisis or Capital Region Industry for Sustainable Infrastructure Solutions. And if you haven't heard of it, go to trafficcrisis.org. And uh, that is where industry and businesses are trying to have a real impact on getting some more roads and bridges built in the region sooner rather than later. And of course, we are running into lots and lots of challenges with that, but we're going to keep plugging away at it. So uh, next, can you, can you perhaps provide an example of a project that the region lost and why? And what could we possibly have done differently? Well, unfortunately, in our business, the journal of negative results is a lot more voluminous than the journal of positive results. So we kiss a lot of frogs, <laughs> frankly. Uh, but, you know, that's part of the business. But just recently, and I can't get into a lot of detail because the project hasn't landed yet, we, we made the short list for a, a traditional manufacturing project, not, in other words, non-chemical, non-process, uh, which was a transportation-related product that was both used in OEM and, and aftermarket. 
and this was a substantial facility, about a million square feet and five or 600 jobs. Uh, we usually don't get into running for those a, uh, a lot, and that's more of a logistics issue because of, of you know, being located so far south. Uh, but in this case, uh, the, there was an export component to, to, the, uh, to the distribution pattern, and so we were involved. We, we made the top 20, <laughs> uh, and then we made the top five, but the end result of it is, is the site that we had because just by the nature of the soil conditions in this part of the world, you know, high water tables, et cetera, the development costs were, were just too high. For, and, you know, we got cut off the list. But yeah. it, it happens. Uh, we were very interested in that, by the way, because it did offer a, an opportunity for diversity uh, in the manufacturing base, which, uh, and, and medium, I would say medium wages uh, not to, you know, nothing to compete with the kind of things you all do, but, you know, I think that would attract, would have attracted part of our, uh, a portion of our labor market that would, would have uh, really need those kind of jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. From, uh, from your perspective, Dennis, have you, do you do I, I haven't been part of any of those okay. projects, so I okay. can't, can't really add too much to that one. Okay, all right. Um, so when the economy shifts, either due to political changes, such as increased taxes and regulations, or due to a market downturn, what impact does that have on your organization's efforts? Well, what we're seeing is, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Scott alluded, didn't allude to it, he said it, we're seeing a lot of delays in decisions. A lot of, a lot of stuff on the move from the front burner to the middle burner, <laughs> some move to the back burner. Uh, you know, I think market conditions is part of that, but I think also uncer uncertainty is our enemy. Uncertainty is your enemy. Uh, and, you know, uh, we're in an environment, uh, you know, it's, it's an election year. <laughs> Nobody needs to be reminded of that. Uh, you know, and we have, you know, a situation going on, you know, here in, in Louisiana where there's just a lot of unknowns. Uh, uh, and, and not a lot of clarity. Uh, you know, if you don't know what your costs are going to be going forward. Uh, you know, that uncertainty is, is our enemy. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get, res you know, sometimes it's do something even if it's wrong. <laughs> At least we'll know what it is uh, and, and can deal with it and make a decision. But, uh, you know, I think there's a, a couple of other factors, you know, not, not to get involved in politics, but, you know, the reality is, you know, in, in uh, January of 2017, we're going to have two junior senators in, in Washington. That's not a good situation to be in. Uh, I know I was, when I was in South Carolina, that happened to us. We had two senior senators, senior, senior senators that retired. And then you here we're left with, with two junior senators at the same time that, that uh, the uh, Department of Defense started their another round of their base closure. So guess what happened? <laughs> it, and politics being politics. But, you know, I think the uncertainty is, is, uh, is, is a great concern to everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, Dennis, how about from, from your perspective, when, when there's dips in the economy, what does that do to workforce training and well, so forth? Well, you know, I said earlier we ride with you guys. <laughs> And gals, and we do, and you know, one of the things that's been difficult for us in this boom, boom period that I, that was here when I got here was then obviously, as Lauren showed on there, you've got projects that are active, that are underway, that people are hiring for, and you've got other projects that are staging to be built, and then we have this issue of when will they come on. And for us, the hardest part of what we do out there is we have to make sure that we're producing workers at the time that they're needed. And so for us, the hardest part of this is not so much just producing the worker, but it's making sure that we're producing them in the times when you have the needs. And so when you get affected, we get affected. And so if we rush out to train large numbers of skilled people and then construction projects get delayed or held off for a while, guess what we have? We have graduates sitting there that we've encouraged to pursue careers. We've really promoted them. And then they sit there and they wait and they wait for offers. 
So for us, the toughest part of this roller coaster is to time our graduates and to make sure that we're not producing too many or too few. And for most of us that are in the training business, you know, we, we felt for a long time now we're going to have a hard time producing enough between us all. But the key thing that we need from all of you is that constant dialogue about where your projects are and how it impacts your workforce. Because it is tough on these young people who go to school, they prepare, they are convinced they're going to get a job, and then they're sitting there and they're holding. And they might be holding for only three months. And to us, that doesn't seem that long. But for those trying to provide for their families, it seems like eternity. So the biggest thing that we can do is have continuous dialogue between all of you and our colleges about not only how many workers will you need, what are the skills, but when do you need them. And we're just like you. We have a hard time taking advantage of go-go, bus-bus situations, and then the dips that happen between that. We're just like you. We're trying to hit that high good, I call it, you know, to hit the numbers as best we can without overproducing and those kind of things. But the answer is still in this issue of partnership. It's in dialogue. It's in hearing from you about what your needs are and when they're going to come online. And we know that there's things that happen in your world that impact those days that you can't change. But talk with us, communicate with us so that we can share that information with students so that they have some idea of what's going on in the market. Okay, great. Thank you. That's, those are all uh, excellent points. That's one of the things we uh, struggle with with Gabri all the time, trying to, trying to do our labor forecasts and so forth. And uh, we're trying our best to share that information and get it out there to folks. But it is definitely a challenge. And we know that uh, industry's credibility kind of takes a hit whenever um, you, they, we've, we've asked for folks to get trained and they can't offer jobs. So uh, industry is definitely concerned about that. Um, so just to wrap it up, what, what do you think we can do collectively to help sustain everyone's efforts uh, through a downturn? So if we're looking at, you know, as Dr. Scott was saying, it looks pretty good right here in the Baton Rouge region uh, for many reasons, but um, there is a trickle, trickle effect there from the from, uh, price of oil being low and so forth. So and I, I know a lot of people are kind of uh, saying, well, when is the other shoe going to drop and so forth, and when's it going to hit us? And uh, what do you think in terms of your efforts, in terms of trying to get new projects and economic development happening and uh, training the workforce and so forth, what can we do better together um, to, to make the dips not so severe and so forth and, and help the community understand or help the community get through it? Uh, what can we do together? Well, I think there's a couple of things, and the, the word infrastructure comes to immediately to mind, whether that's highways or, or whatever, but, but it also involves labor force and skill sets. If we can, uh, even when we're in a downturn, make sure that the resources are still there, you know, at, at, at the community and technical colleges and uh, and, and then fast start and uh, that type of thing to, to you know, ensure that these, these people improve their skills uh, during during this downturn, and maybe as importantly, making sure whatever we could do to keep them from leaving, <laughs> if they've lost their job, uh, keeping them here if we can, because uh, it's hard to get those skill sets back. But that's that's what immediately comes to mind uh, to me. Okay. Well, from my standpoint, I'm very bullish on this region. I think that this region's going to do well. Yeah, we're going to take some licks along the way, and we're going to have some moments that we all pause and wonder about but you know from my standpoint you know what I see working with you every day right now as of right now we haven't seen sort of the downturn affecting your demand for skilled workers and particularly for highly skilled workers and so there's a couple things that I do think we need to do together and one of them is again I mentioned earlier you know the need for entry level workers is always going to be there but I think the challenge that we all have is in upskilling those existing workers to keep them current. The folks that you're losing on those master craft levels are hard to replace. And so, you know, we need to continue to work together to look at these people who are in the middle of the pipeline because we can keep cramming people in the entry level jobs a long time. But one of the things that we're having to do strategically is to look at what contributions can we make now to improving those workers that you already have providing opportunity for them to move to more senior positions. And you know, years ago, that oftentimes meant we had to train them to be managers or supervisors. Today, though, it's, more, it's even more so teaching them more advanced technologies. 
it's not just always stepping up to supervision. It's making sure you're technically competent as materials change, as equipment changes, as those kind of things go. And I think if I look across, and this is all among friends here, I think the one area that we really need to strategically focus on is upskilling that existing workforce that we have and keeping them competitive and keeping them adaptable. And so to me, that's the secret to where we need to be right now.